Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I think it is time to start. It's actually much over time, but we wanted to give you a little more time for lunch. So we are running late now, obviously. My name is Gertrude Postel. I'm representing the APL Executive Committee here. And yes, as one says at occasions like that, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Maria Magaroni to you now. It is a double pleasure because what you don't know is that Maria went through some ordeal just getting here. She has practically a more or less sleepless night, I take it, and just arrived in Klagenfurt about two hours ago. So we are really grateful that she made it and that she agreed to do the lecture at the originally assigned uh, point in time. Uh, this being said, and I try to be brief here because I know we are late, uh, Maria is uh, an associate professor in literature, in literary theory and feminist thought at the University of Cyprus. She also was a visiting uh, fellow at the University of Edinburgh and the University of Leeds. In terms of her publications, of course, all those people who ever got close to Julia Kristeva know Maria Magaroni. So that's, uh, I think, the most expensive task uh, area of her work, but she also wrote on uh, a lot of other issues and other figures such as Beckett, James Joyce, D.H. Lawrence. Uh, from her uh, list of publications, I just mentioned a few uh, well known also for Chris Davis scholars, together with John Lecty, who is here as well in the audience, Julia Chris Davis Life Theory. Uh, then forthcoming, I understand the monograph, Julia Kristeva and the Fate of the Soul, Psychoanalysis, Religion, Neurology. Then also forthcoming, uh, Art of Healing, Cultural Narratives of Trauma. And not to forget, given that, is, that we here have an APL conference, Maria was also the co-editor of the uh, old IPL conference that she organized in Cyprus in 2007, and the volume that resulted from that came out just in 2017, 10 years later, that's okay, but <laughs> it was co-edited by Maria. That's textual layering, contact, historicity, critique. Uh, and there is many more publications, you can look those up for yourself. What's really important to mention here is yes, uh, Maria has a very long history with IPL, and personally speaking, I'm very, very glad that she could make it and that she's here uh, right now. So she organized the 2007 conference, which was a really great event. Unfortunately, for various reasons, she couldn't participate in it herself. Uh, and uh, after that, she was for several years, I can't remember for how many, on the executive committee for the old IPL for several, right? So she really left a mark on the society and since this is a relaunch and a new beginning, I'm very glad that Maria can be part of that. Thus, without any further ado, Maria Magaroni. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my thanks to Gerda, to all the people who have invited me, um, the organizers here, the local organizers, the members of the executive committee. I cannot tell you how great an honor it is to share my work, to be able to share my work with old friends, with people I look up to and admire, with new friends, I hope, uh, with people I look forward to uh, talking um, more about what I am currently engaged in doing. As Gerda um, has already mentioned, my main, the main focus of my work has been Julia Kristeva, but uh, of late I've been doing some work on Catherine Malabou, and so this paper is going to focus on her thought. Catherine Malabou's The New Wounded, From Neurosis to Brain Damage, was originally published in 2007 following a number of philosophical treatises where she set out to explore the concept of plasticity, most notably in the work of Hegel and Heidegger, 
but also in connection with Derridian deconstruction, Levinasian ethics, and current feminist debates on sexual difference. In all of these works, Malabou aims to announce the inauguration of a new philosophical era, one no longer based on the structuralist and post-structuralist privileging of an enlarged concept of writing, but on the neurologically informed motor scheme of plasticity. <clears throat> Since her emergence as a philosopher, Malabou has sought to pursue the implications of employing this motor scheme in approaching a key philosophical theme, namely the dialectic between freedom and determinism, as this is reconfigured in the contemporary landscape of advanced global capitalism, characterized by a concern with productivity and flexibility, terror, foregrounding the precarity of human life, its exposure to fatal accident, and in light of increasing advances in the neurosciences. What distinguishes Malabou from other thinkers of her generation is her willingness to take on board neurological findings on the human brain, thus situating her research at the crossroads between the sciences and the humanities. As an advocate of new materialism, Malabou insists on the need to ground philosophical thought in the material economy of the human brain. From her perspective, taking current neurobiological concerns into consideration can help us approach the old question of the relation between brain and mind in novel ways. In this context, her turn to Sigmund Freud and her attempt to rethink the legacy of psychoanalysis from the vantage point offered by the field of the neurosciences was far from a surprise. The new wounded constitutes an attempt on her part to articulate a materialist theory of trauma outside the traditional Freudian framework. In this book, Malabu takes as a starting point the premise that all trauma, be it psychic or lesion-based, lesion has a serious impact on the affective part of the brain and leads to the production of a new type of patient, one characterized by cool indifference, not only to the world outside, but to his or her suffering. It is this kind of patient whose auto-affection is radically damaged that enables the philosopher to introduce and theorize the concept of destructive plasticity, referring to a form of plasticity which, as she explains, transforms the psychic economy of the subject through the annihilation of his or her identity. In her view, recognizing and reflecting on the emerging category of the new wounded constitutes an important philosophical task today given that, as she characteristically puts it, emotional indifference announces itself as the monstrosity of our time. To fully appreciate Malabu's project in The New Wounded, it is important, I believe, that we take the time to unpack the diverse contexts, concerns and stakes behind her invocation of a new type of patient. If, as she herself points out in her preamble to the book, the determination of psychic disturbances, their definition, their clinical picture and their therapy is not context-free, but is always contemporaneous with a certain state or a certain age of war, as she puts it, then it is imperative to understand the distinct socio-political coordinates that have led the philosopher to introduce new pathological paradigms. Clearly, as the subtitle to the book suggests, Malabu's new wounded is posited beyond and against the old type of a neurotic patient, theorized by Freud largely in response to the devastating impact of the First World War on the human psyche. The main problem Malabu has with Freud's analysis of traumatic neurosis is that it disregards the lesional aspect of the trauma, be it the actual lesion suffered by the subject or the cerebral damage produced by the traumatic shock. As she explains, what matters for Freud is neither the organic lesion as such, nor the impact of the event on the structure of the brain, but the internal conflict that gets revived and remobilized through the action of the external event. This is why Malabu insists that Freud is reluctant to think the brute accident, which is subsumed under the function of the psychic event Freud privileges, namely sexuality, as, quote, the site of an encounter 
between the exogenous and the endogenous, or in other words, the connection between an incident and a signification." End of quote. In Malabu's view, it is precisely this connection between an incident and a signification that is missing in the new cases of trauma we are witnessing. As she argues, fantasy, Freud's privileged mediator between inside and outside, is no longer operative. As a result, the new wounded are unable to fiction some kind of narrative thread that would permit them to integrate the traumatic event within their psychic economy. Radically cut off from their identity, affective bonds and past, they survive. They survive the hermeneutic void of their accidents. They live on, but only as strangers to both self and others. In The New Wounded, Malabu refers explicitly to two contexts that constitute what she calls the distinct states of war in relation to which contemporary psychic pathologies need to be studied. Terrorism and the overwhelming threat of a terrorist attack have clearly shaped Malabu's conceptualization of the traumatic event as a brute, unmotivated accident, a violent rupture of both historical and subjective continuity, an ambiguous occurrence at the borders between natural catastrophe and premeditated crime. In its impersonality and chance impact, the terrorist attack exemplifies for Malabu the senselessness of contemporary forms of trauma, their defiance of all existing hermeneutic frameworks. She writes, the sinister lesson of terrorism lies in its refusal to formulate a lesson, end of quote. Hence, its employment in Malabu's analysis as paradigmatic of what she calls cerebrality. That is, a co this is a concept referring to a causality other than sexuality, a regime of events that seriously damage cerebral functions. Yet, this is not the only state of war Malabu invokes. According to her, the category of the new wounded cannot be understood outside the context of an aggressive global capitalism, which drains its accomplices of all affect and grounds its success in the production of a host of disaffiliated rejects. The unemployed, the underemployed, the homeless, the victims of trafficking or modern slavery. Malabu's key paradigm in this context is Alzheimer's, a neurodegenerative disease which is alarmingly on the rise, especially in the affluent West. Using the Alzheimer's patient as an exemplary case of the contemporary forms of trauma, Malabu argues that the odd unconcern that characterizes this patient is significantly one of the values promoted by an advanced techno-mediated capitalism. The cool indifference of the subject suffering from Alzheimer's is therefore a mirror to the alienation of flexible, performance-oriented workers within the capitalist system, as well as to the drained, drifting existence of the new economic misfits and social outcasts. Bringing together the two states of war presented above is an important strategic move that enables Malabu to demonstrate that coolness, far from the attitude of isolated subjects in the margins of contemporary experience, is in reality the visible symptom of our pathology, of the pathology of our times. Affective barrenness is becoming more and more the norm, she suggests. It is the gaping wound that appears on all the battlefields of contemporary society. This is why Malabu sets out to articulate a general theory of trauma, one aiming to account not merely for patients of neurodegenerative diseases, victims of terrorist attacks, or the disaffiliated within the capitalist system, but, as she notes, for all types of illness that constitute part of the disabilities movement, victims of both natural catastrophes and socio-political violence, as well as for those older forms of trauma which Freudian theory has failed to understand and as a result to cure, that is schizophrenia, autism, epilepsy or the Tourette's syndrome. Malabu is, needless to say, very much aware of the risks 
she is taking in treating all of these diverse maladies as what she calls an amalgam. Yet, she seems to think that the risks are worth taking since the stakes are high. Indeed, one of the philosopher's key concerns in the new wounded is the increasing blurring of the borders between psychic, organic and socio-political trauma. It is not simply that socio-political violence has a material impact on the functions of the brain. More importantly, political violence today, she argues, takes on the guise of nature. Its eruption and impact are unanticipated. It appears cut off from any causality or, or motivation. It obliterates all sense or affect. This is why, in her view, both philosophy and psychoanalysis need to return to what she calls the great question of the relation between biology and the social. The concept of destructive plasticity she introduces aims at reopening this question in positing the operation of an annihilating power, the equivalent of the death drive, within the brain of every human being. If this biologically determined power is unleashed, as she argues, by non-biological forms of trauma, constituting the organism's response to extreme situations where no escape is possible, then doesn't finitude post Heidegger manifest itself not in our being towards death, but in the form of a paradoxical survival, that is, of a surplus of life in the very void of life. Survival, Malabu writes, sometimes manifests itself as the indifference of life to life, as a farewell that is not death, a farewell that occurs within life. I find Malabu's foregrounding of survival as an existential possibility between Eros and Thanatos most important. I find it important because I, I think I agree with what I feel the impetus of her analysis is. That is, the impetus of her analysis on my reading is that the aim today is not to ensure survival at all costs, but to resist mere survival as the ambiguity of this flat existence that is neither life nor death, but an indifference to both life and death. According to Malabu, understanding this ambiguous existential mode is the first step towards recognizing the contemporary configurations, not only of human suffering, but also of human cruelty. In other words, understanding the vegetating existence of a victim of extreme violence and oppression, the indifference to life, others, and one's own demonstrated by terrorists and the cold-blooded serial killer, the affect-drained survival of the social outcast, or the odd and concern of the alienated but productive worker in global capitalism. As she argues, these configurations can no longer be approached from within the Freudian psychoanalytic tradition. The forms of cruelty we are currently witnessing are not the product of aggression or the expression of hatred, both of which involve an acknowledgement of another. They need to be perceived instead in connection with this uncanny link between biology and the social, a link which, she reminds us, translates brain lesions into lesions in otherness. As a result, both suffering and making suffer today seem to share the same death-like face of emotional apathy or cool indifference. Though Malabu insists on the contemporaneity of this death-like face, her account in The New Wounded makes it clear that this face is not deprived of a name or a history. In her preamble to the new wounded, Malabu acknowledges the impact of 20th century and 21st century military conflicts on the emergence as well as the evolution of our concepts of trauma. She does not explicitly refer to Walter Benjamin, one of the most penetrating analysts of the intimate and collective effects of the First World War, yet his post-war testimony to the loss of communicable experience and the bankruptcy of collective narrative seems to inform Malabu's understanding of the nature of trauma in terms of a hermeneutic void. 
Interestingly, in Goethe's elective affinities, Benjamin develops the notion of the expressionless, which, Shoshana Feldman argues, lies at the heart of his conceptualization of history as trauma. Pursuing the implications of this notion in connection with questions relating to genocide, oppression and crimes against humanity, Feldman comes to define the expressionless in terms that introduce, I believe, an illuminating subtext to Malabu's analysis of the new wounded, giving it a historical depth Malabu herself does not openly acknowledge and an added political significance. This is Feldman's definition of the expressionless. Expressionless are those whom violence has deprived of expression, those who have been historically made faceless, those whom violence has paralyzed, defaced or deadened, those whom violence has treated in their lives as though they were already dead, those who have been made in life without expression, without a voice and without a face. In other words, what in Benjamin was primarily a literary concept becomes in the hands of Feldman a powerful cipher for the psychically exhausted subject, especially for that ghostly, lifeless remnant that emerges in the figure of the Holocaust survivor, one trapped in the ambiguous zone between the no longer living and the not yet dead, unable to give expression to anything other than history and its petrifying death's head. In this light, it is no wonder that in the preamble to the new wounded, Malabu refers to Bruno Bettelheim, his analytic work, as one of her sources of her inspiration in this book. Bruno Bettelheim, survivor of a concentration camp himself, has acquired fame and indeed some kind of notoriety due to his distinct approach to autism. Rather than go along with the then consensus regarding the organic origins of autism, Bettelheim insists instead on approaching autism as the product of extreme existential circumstances. Noting that autistic children pre present symptoms similar to those exemplified by a certain type of camp inmate known as a Muslim, Bettelheim sets out to demonstrate that autistic children withdraw into their own universe in their attempt to defend themselves against what they experience, though it may not necessarily be true, as an extreme form of violence. According to Bettelheim, these children's unresponsiveness, their reluctance to use language and acknowledge an other, me, and, and acknowledge an other need to be perceived in relation to the Muslims' total emotional depletion and absolute dehumanization. In his view, understanding the connection between what on the one hand is a form of dehumanization, quote, inflicted for political reasons on victims of a social system, and on the other hand, a self-chosen state of dehumanization, end of quote, is a necessary step to the treatment of autism. This is precisely the project he undertakes in his establishment of the Orthogenic School in Chicago, which has been perceived as his unique response to his devastating experience in the camp. As Giorgio Agamben puts it, the, in, the Orthogenic School had the form of a kind of counter camp, in which Bettelheim undertook to teach Muslimaner to become men again. And this was a quote from Agamben. In her own return to Bettelheim, Malabu acknowledges her indebtedness to his methods, that is, as she explains, to the type of gaze that he brought to the study of autistic children. It is this type of gaze that she seeks to adopt in her decision to think together brain lesion and sociopolitical trauma, a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's, and the spectrum of pathologies included in the category of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is perhaps why the figure of the Muslim employed by Bettelheim as, quote, the dark precursor and interpretative paradigm of childhood autism, falls like a shadow upon Malabu's conceptualization of the new wounded. Indeed, from Primo Levi to Bettelheim and Agamben, the Muslim is described as a liminal figure situated at the threshold between life and death. As we have seen, Malabu's traumatized subjects share precisely this liminal in-between existence. 
Similarly, the Muslim's apathetic attitude to his, her, to his or her surroundings, his or her emotional withdrawal, the mask-like indifference of his or her face are all traits that appear in Malabu's phenomenology of new forms of trauma. More importantly, what gets reiterated in all accounts of the Muslim is that she or he is the paradigmatic figure of survival, a survival devoid of life. In Remnants of Auschwitz, Agamben seems to be especially interested in the connection between the Muslim and a certain mode of survival that marks the dehumanization of the human. Discussing if this is a man, he traces this connection back to Primo Levi. This is what Agamben writes. The human being, Levi's title implies, is the one who can survive the human being. End of quote. Pursuing Levi's insight, Levi's insight further, Agamben traces in the figure of the Muslim the workings of a force which is very close to Malabu's destructive plasticity. As he puts it, life bears with it a caesura that can transform all life into survival and all survival into life. End of quote. Like in Malabu, in Agamben, survival is the nightmare of a vegetative life that is the remainder of a life of relation. Interestingly, survival comes to function in Agamben as the secret cipher for biopower and characterizes the existential mode of both victim and victimizer. Quoting Bettelheim, he refers to Rudolf Hoss, the commander of Auschwitz, as a well-fed and well-clothed well Muslim who was, quote, little more than a machine, functioning only as his superiors flicked the batons of command, end of quote. Survival then, for Agamben, becomes the supreme ambition of biopower, the optimum condition for the production of pliable, functional, disposable bodies, bared of all emotion and communal ties. In my analysis of Malabu's The New Wounded, my aim so far has been to throw light on the distinct contexts that have shaped her approach to contemporary forms of trauma. In particular, I have suggested that the global phenomena of terrorism and an advanced techno-capitalism have had a determining influence on Malabu's conceptualization of the nature of the traumatic event and her concern with the production of a new flat mode of existence, a form of survival, as the empty husk of life. I have then moved on to bring into focus the layered history of this understanding of survival, from Benjamin and Feldman to Bettelheim and Agamben. In light of this layered history, survival in Mal Malabu appears to be not simply the existential mode that characterizes the new wounded, but a biopolitical strategy, one that appears to be central in the capitalist management of bodies, in the biomedical separation of vegetative life that is less than nothing from life worth saving, as much as in a never-expanding culture of death where, as Malabu argues, Hannah Arendt's conviction in the banality of evil takes on a novel significance. Malabu writes, quote, Making suffer today manifestly assumes the guise of the neutrality and senselessness of a blow without author and without history, of mechanical violence and of the absence of interiority. Evil is the, is the becoming insensate of evil. End of quote. The perspective I have offered so far explains, I believe, the philosopher's insistence on articulating a comprehensive theory for both organic and sociopolitical forms of trauma. It also explains her persistent refusal to propose any forms of cure to the new pathologies she is analyzing. Instead, she suggests that what is urgent is to take the time to reflect on the clinical and philosophical problem posed by destructive plasticity, a problem which, according to her, needs to be thought in connection with a Freudian concept of the death drive, a material understanding of accident, and a, neurobiolo and, and a neurologically informed approach to the cerebral event. These are precisely the terms in which Malabu envisions the emergence of a neuropsychoanalysis that will undertake to reclaim life as a form of resistance against mere survival, or, as she puts it, 
quoting Alan Ehrenberg, against, quote, the multiple maintenance programs which condemn us to be chronically healthy and which serve to make us work better, feel better, indeed obey better. In the remainder of my talk, I would like to take up Malabu's challenge to rethink life as counter-survival, an issue which the philosopher has not yet sufficiently pursued. In my ventures in this direction so far, I have stumbled again and again over Malabu's understanding of the brute traumatic accident. In The New Wounded, she summarizes this understanding as follows. The destructive event that whether it is of biological or sociopolitical origin, causes irreversible transformations of the emotional brain and thus a radical metamorphosis of identity, emerges as a constant existential possibility that threatens each of us every moment. At every instant, we are all susceptible to becoming new wounded, prototypes of ourselves, without any essential relation to the past of our identities." End of quote. In this passage, Malabu is interestingly reiterating a conviction put forward by one of Alan Moore's supervillains, namely the Joker. In what is bound to be his final confrontation with his archenemy, the Batman, the Joker insists, and I'm quoting from The Killing Joke, all it takes is one bad day to reduce the sanest man alive to lunacy. That's how far the world is from where I am. Just one bad day. You had a bad day once, am I right? I know I am. I can tell. You had a bad day and everything changed. Why else would you dress up like a flying rat? You had a bad day and it drove you as crazy as everybody else. Only you won't admit it. You have to keep pretending that life makes sense, that there's some point to all this struggling. I mean, what is it with you? What made you what you are? The uncanny echoing in this scene of a number of Malabu's key premises in The New Wounded cannot be missed. Like Malabu, the Joker foregrounds the explosive plasticity of the traumatic event, this something which, as he tells Batman, he no longer remembers, but which has cut him off from his past sense of self. He insists on the metamorphic power of this event, its contingency, its inevitability, its resistance to any process of interpretation. As he suggests, the only spacing, difference, between himself and Batman on the one hand and an ordinary person on the other hand, or if you like, between sanity and what he calls madness, a suffering that has led him to cynical indifference and has trans transformed Batman into a child's version of a hero, is merely that of one bad day, which is only around the corner, not here yet, but bound to come. The Joker's challenge, in the form of a question addressed to Batman, what made you what you are, offers an interesting context, I believe, to Malabu's own preoccupation with the contemporary faces of evil, a suggestion that at the origins of evil lies a monstrous what that forces us to rethink not only our concepts of the human, but also our assumptions of a connection between the choice of good or evil, freedom and responsibility. From the Joker's perspective, the Batman, as the principle of good, is closer to him, the principle of evil, than to the ordinary man, because he too has been touched by a traumatic event. He too has been reduced to an empty form, hollow doubt of life. If the problematic of evil, as elaborated by Moore and artist Brian Boland in Batman, The Killing Joke, is compelling, at least it is for me, 
This is because it invites us to think of the difference between good and evil, no longer on the level of an assumed content, an inherent essence that keeps good and evil apart, but precisely on the level of form. This is yet another connection with Malabu's approach to this issue, given her concern with reclaiming the philosophical value of form through her concept of plasticity and her insistence on the need to move beyond a motor scheme which centers on writing, inscription, and the trace. As I have mentioned, the traumatic event in Malabu is neither inscribed on the mystic writing pad of the subject's psyche, nor does it inscribe it, for it is the very textual nature of the psyche that gets destroyed. The event neither activates old psychic traces, nor does it leave any trace. This is why Malabu argues that the subject's illness cannot offer a glimpse of a truth inherent in the history of the subject. If the effects of the traumatic event are plastic that is giving and exploding form, deforming and transforming at the same time, and if indifference is the form that contemporary trauma takes in every wounded subject, then the question we cannot fail to address, I believe, concerns the plasticity of indifference itself as the form of the, of the subject's absence. What conditions of trauma have produced a joker rather than a Batman? And how do we interpret the joker's utter failure when, in his attempt to demonstrate the explosive impact of one bad day, he rapes and cripples the commissioner's daughter, abducts and savagely tortures the commissioner, only to find out that he senselessly clings to his senses and to what the Joker calls the hideously bloated sense of humanity's importance. Are the contemporary faces of the wounded one and the same death mask? If life has counter survival standard chance, what forms could it take? On my reading, these questions like lie at the heart of Alan Moore's universe of superheroes and supervillains, a universe haunted by the traumas of the Second World War, the Cold War period, the legacies of totalitarianism, terror and the threat of, the, of a Third World War, the fear of a nuclear catastrophe. Employing the tradition of the comic, Moore's writings invite what Malabu calls a plastic reading, since graphic fiction always appeals to the eye bordering discourse, the eye concerned with form and figure rather than word and sense. More importantly, perhaps, choosing to write within the superhero genre, Moore suggests that the plasticity of form, creative or destructive transformation, may have something to do with Freud's chameleon-like mediator that Malabu is eager to throw out along with a graphic model of the human psyche. Indeed, though Freud may not be a thinker of the brute event, as Malabu argues, he is certainly a thinker of form and of the plastic and hence formal nature of fantasy. This, you may remember, is Slavoj Zizek's argument in the sublime object of ideology. Drawing on Zizek, and with close reference to Moore's Watchmen and V for Vendetta, I will venture to suggest that the psychoanalytic concept of fantasy may continue to be useful in thinking about the delibidinized, emotionally exhausted subjects that concern Malabu. To paraphrase a comment of one of Freud's interlocutors in the Vienna Psychoanalytical <coughs> Society, just like empty shells are used as a home by the hermit crab, so, I will argue, empty or emptied out fantasies can be inhabited by traumatized subjects. <clears throat> Making clear references to key traumatic events of the 20th century and unfolding around the dark void of a terror-haunted future, Moore's graphic novels dramatize what Malabu describes as the natural catastrophe of contemporary politics. In Watchmen, memories of Hiroshima and the Holocaust, a present palpitating around the fresh wounds of Vietnam, the Kennedy assassination and McCarthyism, 
as well as the shadow of a looming Third World War, set the scene for the eruption of the, brut of the brutal event that will mark the closure of the novel. The event, orchestrated by Ozymandias, one of Moore's most ambiguous supervillains, end up killing half of New York. Though it is the product of meticulous political machination, it is received by most people as an incomprehensible blow that leaves them numb, frightened and confused. The perfect pawns on Ozymandias' closely monitored checkerboard. In V for Vendetta, accident and political crime converge when after a near-miss nuclear conflict, England is taken over by a totalitarian regime calling itself Norsefire. Ruled by a man who has become a servant to the cool intelligence of a computer called Fate, the regime employs a number of apparatuses aptly named the ear, the eye, the nose, the mouth, the finger, whose aim it is to desensitize and control the people, reduce them to the torporific state that produces both victims and victimizers. Concentration camps remain invisible, but they are fully operative, systematically used to get rid of all sorts of undesirable subjects who are imprisoned, tortured, sent to ovens, submitted to biomedical experiments. The denizens of Moore's dystopic universe, woven together, as we have seen, by traces of humanity's past and fears of its impending future, are clearly identified as members of the new international, Malabu describes in The New Wounded. Passive or active heroes or villains, victims, criminals, government officials, they are all depicted as figures of the void or of identitarian abandonment. Deeply traumatized and compulsively perpetuating trauma, their every action or lack of it is dictated by behavioral and emotional absence. Their flat existence is a mere hanging on to a life deprived of eros and its changing objects. Given this context, it is no wonder that Moore's superheroes are so ambiguous, so unfamiliar compared to the creatures populating our Hollywood fashioned imaginary. It is true that among them, we can still find the old type of hero or villain, the former being the product of wishful fantasy, for example, Dan Dryberg, the night owl. The latter, an intrusive example of megalomania and excessive lust for power, for example, Ozymandias, whom I have already mentioned. Yet these types are not the central figures in Moore's narratives. Rather than creatures of adolescent fantasy, his main characters are the empty forms of pure distraction Malabu theorizes. They are only instantiated by individuals who have themselves been formed by personal or communal experiences of distraction. For instance, in Watchmen, John Osterman, a physicist, is the victim of an atomic accident who reassembles himself as Dr. Manhattan, America's lethal weapon against the Russians. Walter Kovacs is an abandoned an abused child, transformed by the abject violence and apathy he witnesses around him into a murderer of murderers. He calls himself Roschak. Eddie Blake, the comedian, is reborn as evil incarnate and Nixon's right hand out of the hell of Vietnam. In The Killing Joke, the Joker is physically and emotionally disfigured when he falls into toxic waters after his pregnant wife's death and a failed robbery attempt. Finally, <clears throat> V in V for Vendetta emerges as an Orpheus figure returning from the underworld of Lark Hill resettlement camp. Moore pays close attention to the formation and transformation of his new wounded. He traces the explosive power of the traumatic event and the metamorphic effects of suffering. 
Even when they perform benevolent heroic deeds, his traumatized protagonists look monstrous because of their absolute disaffection, their inability to relate to others, their unnerving and sometimes frightening neutrality, which keeps them apart in an autistic realm. In Watchmen, Dr. Manhattan actually end up, ends up in Mars, from where life and death appear unquantifiable abstracts. He tells Rorschach, a live body and a dead body contain the same number of particles. Structurally, there's no discernible difference. Why should I be concerned? At the end of the narrative, faced with the effects of Ozymandias' terror-inflicting attack, aimed at preventing a third world war, he only remarks, I understand without condoning or condemning. Human affairs cannot be my concern. Rorschach, in his own turn, moves in a world without subject and object. For him, only the abject exists, humanity as abject. Refusing to wash, Wearing a face made out of the discarded dress of a woman raped and murdered, speaking in a monotone voice, he makes himself abject to others and is pitiless because he is unable to occupy a position of empathy. Talking to the prison psychiatrist, Dr. Malcolm, he describes the process of his metamorphosis into Rorschach after the abduction and violent death of a six-year-old girl. He tells Malcolm, the void breathed hard on my heart, turning its illusions to eyes, shattering them, was reborn then, was Rorschach. Transposing Rorschach's expressionless face onto Dr. Manhattan's, Blake's, Ozymandias's, but also onto the faces of ordinary people who do not want to know, who could not care less, more, demonstrates that neutrality is indeed the psychic form of rapture. Converging with Malabu, he too seems to suggest that indifference is the monstrosity of our times. Yet, if Pace Malabu, this is the political message of contemporary neurology, this is not because it only takes one bad day to find oneself transformed into Blake or Rorschach, a serial killer or an apathetic cog in the capitalist machine. In fact, I would contend, it takes some work, not necessarily perceived or consciously carried out by the traumatized subject. Drawing on Freud's analysis of the dream work, Zizek rethinks fantasy precisely in terms of work. In other words, as the elaboration and staging of a series of scenes. Bringing together Freud's concept of unconscious fantasy, which operates retroactively, and Lacan's rethinking of it as a structural psychic formation in relation to which the subject is merely a prop, Zizek succeeds in articulating a more politically inflected understanding of fantasy, which is not dependent on or produced by a psychic interiority. He therefore moves beyond a textual, content-based thought of fantasy, woven together by psychic inscriptions of external and internal events or erased traces, to a more, to what I would call, a more plastic reading, foregrounding its embodiment, its materialization within particular ideological contexts. In this spirit, the work of fantasy for Zizek is carried out around objects, floating, unbound objects, which are no longer or not yet signifiers in a narrative sequence. As he points out in the sublime object of ideology, the Lacanian Akri has a status of an object, not of a signifier. In my view, Zizek's theorization of fantasy, a theorization which is sensitive to the different forms fantasies take and their inherent plasticity, is more appropriate, most appropriate, for a renewed understanding of Malabu's traumatized subjects and the political stakes of this emergent clinical category. Let me sum up some questions raised in the context of the reading I am proposing here. First, does the destruction of a subject's life narrative 
go hand in hand with the elimination of those objects the subject was once attached to, the sublime objects, as Zizek calls them, that played a quilting role in his or her narrative? Are these objects perhaps delibidinized and set loose rather than utterly erased from memory? In Moore's post-traumatic universe, at least, these objects remain operative and play a significant role in the transformation of the wounded subject, serving as the prima materia out of which the subject's psychic absence is sculpted into a form. For example, in Watchmen, John's metamorphosis into Dr. Manhattan, a figure which brings together the 20th century image of the atomic scientist, and the 17th, 18th century notion of God as Le Grand Horloger is elaborated around a series of floating watches, clocks, timers, time bombs, and atom bombs. Rorschach, compared to a filthy animal, a mad dog, or raw shark in the novel, develops out of disparate, devouring scenes. The comedian and the joker are variations of smiley faces, clown figures, and the type of transformational mask which turns smiling into a grimace. As for V, we are told he is no thing, no body other than the stuff that dreams are made of. A Guy Fox mask, a rose garden, a domino, and scattered quotes from classical literary works. Second question, if a wounded subject's sublime objects survive his or her scripts, what is their fate? Given that the traumatized subject has withdrawn all affective investment in these floating objects and is incapable of creating his or her own imaginary scenarios, because as Julia Kristeva would put it, his or her camera obscura has become dysfunctional, then how do they continue to serve as support for an impoverished subject, their emptied out shells turning into an unhomely, temporary home for hermit souls? Zizek's concept of ideological fantasy might be of use in this context, as it might help us understand how traumatized subjects without interiority might still be gripped by particular practices and discourses while remaining cold, disinvested towards them. According to Zizek, ideological fantasies interpolate subjects from the position of another, of the other, integrating them in logics which operate in terms of subjective modes or fixed ethological patterns, aggression, submission, adherence to a norm, transgression, active, passive, etc. Isn't the wounded subject's detached inhabiting of such fantasies precisely the reason why Malabu insists on the political significance of her new clinical category? Isn't this why she sees in the contemporary flat modes of existence the neuronal form of a political and social functioning that breeds and maintains a global citizenry that is apathetic and in a sense blinded? The works by Alan Moore I am discussing today seem to confirm this suggestion. Both Dr. Manhattan and Blake end up working for the American government, performing actions, the morality of which either escapes or leaves them cold. Rorschach's own uncompromising vigilante career serves as a support for the black and white anti-communist fantasies perpetuated by fascist newspaper The New Frontiersman whereas the Joker's moral nihilism offers comfortable refuge against the commissioner's own fantasy of a noble, neutral law. In this light, what forms of life, what modes of resistance might we develop against the spreading grip of a neurally and socio-politically induced indifference? Interestingly, both Zizek and Alan Moore invite us to continue reflecting on the vital, or if you like, the V possibilities, offered by fantasy. <clears throat> in the sublime object of ideology, Zizek reflects on the dangers inherent in avoided subjectivity, 
when reduced to, quote, an empty place in which his or her whole content is procured by others, by the symbolic network of intersubjective relations, end of quote. He continues to write, his content, what he is, would be determined by an exterior signifying network offering him the points of symbolic identification, conferring on him certain symbolic mandates. This, he explains, is Lacan's definition of a fool, the man or woman who is not capable of a dialectically mediated distance towards himself or herself. Significantly, it is the absence of mediated distance that, according to Bettelheim, characterizes the Muslim. He writes, the Muslim who let the SS get hold of him went on to internalize the SS attitude that he was less than a man, that he was not to act on his own, that he had no personal will. Drawing on Lacan's anecdote of, the philosopher, of a philosopher, Zhuang Zi, who dreamt he was a butterfly and ended up thinking he was a butterfly, dreaming it was a philosopher, Zizek suggests that Lacan offers us another possibility beyond the mode of flat survival, which, as we have seen, reduces the subject to a form of absence open to the socio-political work of ideological feeling. This possibility, he argues, is no other than fantasy, since it materializes through the subject's transformation into an object of fantasy, Zhuang Zi's dream of being a butterfly. Zizek writes, in the symbolic reality, he was Zhuang Zi, but in the real of his desire, he was a butterfly. To go back to the Batman-Joker question I raised earlier, this is perhaps how we might understand the difference between these two subjects, both traumatized, both transformed by the touch of a traumatic event. The Joker is, after all, the figure of the fool par excellence, Though Batman offers him the glimpse of other possibilities, he refuses to adopt a distance from what he calls reality and accommodates his traumatized interiority within the empty shell of a life caricatured as a black, awful joke. The Batman, by contrast, insists on preserving a position outside the joke. I've heard it before, and it wasn't funny the first time, he tells the Joker. The form of this disidentification from the ideological fantasy offered to him by an obscene other is that of a flying rat. Yet, contra, in contrast to the Joker's interpretation of it, the Batman's refusal to fully identify with life as a joke is not an escape from reality, a pretense, as Joker suggests, as the Joker suggests, but a form of resistance against the fantasy that imprisons the Joker within the distorting mirrors of his inverted fun house. As such, this is a vector pulling the Batman in a direction other than that taken by the Joker. One, it needs to be noted, that does not fully coincide with the commissioner's blind adherence to the law. The Batman's identification with a fantasy object, therefore, that is a flying rat, is what preserves him as a desiring subject outside the desire of both an obscene and a noble other. In my view, this is perhaps what is at stake in the face of the contemporary monstrosity that takes the form of indifference, namely, how to rekindle desire against desire, fantasy against fantasy. As Zizek suggests, the usual definition of fantasy, the one I think Malabu depends on, is therefore somewhat misleading. Fantasy is not an imagined scenario representing the realization of desire. It is not the expression of a past or an interiority. In the fantasy scene, Zizek writes, the desire is not fulfilled, satisfied, but constituted. Or in other words, in the fantasy scene, desire is given its objects. To quote Zizek again, through fantasy, we learn how to desire. I would like to conclude very briefly by suggesting that V in Moore's V for Vendetta is precisely this plastic principle of learning. This is why he is no mere flesh and blood, but life, la vie, as the resistance to living on, and the explosive force Malabu calls, and please forgive my 
German pronunciation, Verwandlung. <laughs> that is, a change of form, or indeed, a change of scene. As I have already mentioned, V is an Orpheus figure, a survival from Larkhill resettlement camp, where he was subjected to horrific biomedical experiments which transformed him into a creature that is no longer human, both with regards to his superior intelligence and his abnormal physical strength. To Inspector Finch, the head of the nose, he is monstrous because he disposes of people without any hesitation, pity or guilt. He is a figure truly fashioned by trauma. We know nothing about his childhood or his past before his imprisonment in the camp. We do not know why he was imprisoned, his true face or name. Codename V, as he is called, is the product of an explosion, the one that destroyed Larkhill resettlement camp. And he is an explosive event in himself, as suggested by the mask of Guy Fox he chooses to wear. In the course of the narrative, he orchestrates a number of spectacular explosions that destroy the Houses of Parliament and the Old Bailey, blind the eye, cripple the ear, and muffle the mouth, thus silencing the voice of fate. On my reading, V has two functions in the novel. On the one hand, he is the figure of destruction and a disillusioning agent. The aim of his elaborate plan is to expose the ideological fantasies that constitute the supporting frame of the reality established by the totalitarian regime. Discrediting one by one all the objects that lend form to these fantasies, <clears throat> that is faith, purity, security, strength, England, he brings about the collapse of the phantasmatic structure that has kept people in a state of apathy. The task he sets himself then resembles that of the Lacanian analyst who seeks to help the wounded subject traverse the reality-protecting fantasy, thus re-experiencing its fascinating objects as fillers for an unacknowledged void at the heart of reality. In the novel, this takes the form of both the void of authority screamed by the computer fate and that of the traumatic kernel which gradually soaks up Inspector Finch, leaving him more and more destitute as he gets closer to the memories and remains of Larkhill resettlement camp. In fact, V's Verwandlung force lies in his ability to remobilize the traumatic event in ways that allow him to replay it now as tragedy, now as farce, or in other words, first as deadly vengeance, then as a life chance. On the other hand, V is, of course, the master illusionist himself. Stage director, orchestra conductor, game strategist and Brechtian performer all at once. He elaborates scene after scene according to an invisible pattern unfolding around the void, the void of Larkhill resettlement camp. In reenacting trauma as seen, his aim is to activate its fictioning power, letting the fiction speak to those who will listen. Inspector Finch, for example, is a good listener. In her engagement with Freud, Malabu emphasizes precisely that trauma cannot speak without the mediation of a phantasmatic work. It is such work that V is determined to provide. Acting against the regime's meticulous attempts to erase all traces of the camp, he puts up a series of screens on which the form of the traumatic event can gradually be discerned, sculpted out of its effects on those touched by it, both victims and victimizers. At the same time, he recharges the voided event. He returns to it the suffering that has been denied, thus rendering possible an empathic connection with his suffering from a position in the present. This is, in fact, how V succeeds in transforming Inspector Finch from a compliant tool in the hands of the regime to a virginal creature, this is how he's called at the end of the graphic novel, open to, quote, this verve, this vitality, this vision, la voix, la vérité, la vie, end of quote. As Finch tells Dominic, his young apprentice, after his return from the traumatic site and an LSD-induced experiencing of others' suffering, those people outside lost families during the war. We've kept the lead on their bitterness for years, but we haven't helped them deal with it. 
Maybe he didn't either, but he certainly took the lid off, just like Lark Hill did for me. Everything's different now, Dominic. I don't belong here anymore. What v, do, what v does then is to reactivate the psychical scenography of traumatized subjects, helping them not to remember, but to reconnect with what they have forgotten through the mediation of what John Fletcher aptly calls in his discussion of Freud, as you know, memorial fantasies or phantasmatic memories. In doing so, he really bidinizes the emotionally drained subjects, giving them back desire, or more accurately, the desire not to give up on desire. This is clearly thrown into relief in V's relationship with Evie, a young woman of 16, who he saves from the clutches of corrupted police officers. Evie is introduced to us as a victim being traumatized by the war, the fear-inducing totalitarian regime, the death of her mother, the arrest and final disappearance of her father. As a victim, she has internalized the view that the regime has projected on her. I'm nobody, she tells V. She puts up no resistance and struggles to ensure for herself a minimum survival. If V is successful in transforming Evie from present victim to the future V, this is because he teaches her that life becomes possible the moment one refuses survival. To this end, he interestingly reenacts the Joker's experiment in The Killing Joke. Disguising himself as a policeman, he abducts Evie, imprisons her, and submits her to what the Joker calls a hard dose of reality, forcing her to acknowledge the pain that's not letting her breathe, the smallness of the cell that keeps her, quote, hunched and deformed, end of quote. Whereas the Joker seeks to deprive his subject of all phantasmatic content and hence of his inner life, leaving him devastated, V, by contrast, offers E.V. a fiction, a fantasy object, which rekindles her desire and helps her identify with a position of suffering outside herself. This, he tells her later, is the fiction that made him too what he is, not the impact of one bad day. We do not know how much of the story he offers Evie is based on fact. We are told that Valerie was a lesbian actress arrested and experimented upon by the regime. Though she died in the hands of her torturers, she has left a legacy, the gift of her story written on toilet paper, hidden in a niche inside her cell. In fact, it is this niche, this hollow in the other's desire, that becomes the material manifestation of the phantasmatic object that is passed on from victim to victim in Moore's graphic novel. From Valerie to V, Inspector Finch, Evie, young Dominic, and finally to the people in London. As Valerie confesses, this object is as insignificant an illusion as a mere inch, though it is plastic enough to take the form of freedom, integrity, love, a small rose garden, or what V identifies with, that is, the metamorphic emptiness of idea. Perhaps, after all, it is this inch that separates one wounded subject from another, desire from desire, good from evil, a Batman from a Joker. In the concluding scene of the final confrontation, the Joker tells Batman a joke, and please bear with me because I will tell you the joke. There were two guys in a lunatic asylum, and one night they decide they don't like living in an asylum anymore. They decide they're going to escape. So they get up onto the roof, and there, just across this narrow gap, they see the rooftops of the town, stretching away in the moonlight, stretching away to freedom. Now, the first guy, he jumps right across with no problem. But his friend, his friend, daren't make the leap. You see, he's afraid of falling. So then the first guy has an idea. He says, hey, I have my flashlight with me. I'll shine it across the gap between the buildings. You can walk along the beam and join me. But the second guy just shakes his head. He says, what do you think I am, crazy? 
You turn it off when I was halfway across. The joke, needless to say, restages the confrontation between the two opponents and leads the confrontation to an end for as soon as the Batman relaxes into a smile and then into uncontrollable laughter, he becomes a vulnerable victim at the Joker's disposal. In bringing the story to a sinister end, this final scene reveals perhaps not the content of good and evil, but what Zizek would call the secret of their form. A Batman, then, is the form a wounded subject takes when at the risk of death, she or he will walk the precarious inch lit by the flashlight of an impossible desire. A joker, by contrast, will look at the fiction of a luminous beam and will only see a killing joke. Thank you. This is a somewhat provocative question, and you can choose to not answer. <laughs> sure. But I'm just wondering how you feel about Agamben's idea that we live in a concentration camp, given that you refer to the Musulman um, to bring up the whole idea of survival. And of course, your emphasis as well has been on our mere survival yeah, in, in yeah. modernity. It uh, seems to me that perhaps, and I don't have a problem with this myself, you're, you're, in a way, confirming his conception, for which hmm. he has been extremely criticized. <laughs> I guess what I was doing in this paper is I was saying, if Malabu is right, and this is the case, then is this why it is politically interesting? Is this why? Okay, is it one bad day that threatens to lead us in this direction? I mean, certainly, the, the threads you're bringing together are there in the talk. And this is really what I'm saying. I mean, Malibu has not thrown this into sufficient relief, though, of course, Zizek has taken it up. And it's there in her theorization of the new wounded. I, I do not think that she's talking about the contemporary faces, okay, because... This is there in the Second World War and our experience in the camp, the experience that we have as this legacy from the camp. So this is there, this thread is there. I mean, what she's talking about is that this form of survival, this form of flat existence is becoming more and more of a problem and it is becoming more and more of a problem because this is the case in various contexts in life. This is why I'm trying... You see, this project with Malabu has started with a number of questions I had to her. And I'm, as you can see, I mean, this, the, the kinds of answers I'm offering are far from perfect, I'm far, from, are far from satisfactory, but I'm trying in different papers to deal with the kinds of things she's saying try to take her seriously and try to understand where she's coming from. Which is why I have rather tired, perhaps it has been tiring for you, but it was important for me to give a context before moving on to raising a few questions about what it is that she's saying. So this is why I think it's very important for her to make a claim about a general theory of trauma because the new wounded are indeed, from her perspective, everywhere. And this is where Agamben comes in. We are living in a concentration camp. Survival is the form of existence, the form of absence, okay, that we seem to be condemned to. And then, of course, her question is very important, but the, there is precisely where I remain unsatisfied with Malabu because, at least to the present, I do not believe she has taken up this question 
seriously and sufficiently that is to explain what form of life she has in mind as counter survival, as this kind of resistance. Given that I'm um, sort of, you know, working in the area of literature, Alan Moore, a very favorite sort of um, author, uh, has become important, helping me think some of the questions I'm raising. Thank you very much. I, I think it's interesting that your answer in, includes the phrase form of life, which is another yes, Agambinian. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes, idea. And yes, thank yes. you for the talk. I thought it was extremely rich. Just thank you. Absolutely thank you. excellent. So, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so, given that you mentioned the Muso men, uh, it made me think about my brother who is autistic. Um, and given also that Malibu is talking about the neurological and biological um, inheritance of trauma, I wonder how this can be used to um, explain how, inher how we inherit trauma, considering that my brother has no relation to, um, or he does of course, but no direct relation to those events. Um, and, I, uh, and relatedly, um, he was treated in the standard way, um, which, which meant that he is now uh, uh, very much an apathetic modern subject. Uh, and, and he's considered a success pre precisely because he's been more successful than was thought uh, possible. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I have to say right from the beginning that Bettelheim's, I mean, some of you may know about Bettelheim, so I'd better mention it right from the start. Bettelheim's treatment of autism, or what he had diagnosed as autism, because there are even doubts on whether the kinds of patients he had in his orthogenic school were actually autistic. So his treatment of um, autistic patients was very much criticized, and he had adopted uh, very um, uh, dubious means. So obviously what I'm doing here is not suggesting that Bettelheim was right, okay, and that current tendencies, okay, uh, in the treatment of autism are, not, are wrong. Um, what I want, what, uh, what was interesting to me is the connection with Bettelheim is a survival from a concentration camp. I think Agamben is right, and I think this is precisely why Bettelheim, I mean, I'm, I'm not psychoanalyzing uh, Bettelheim, of course, but I think one of the reasons Bettelheim was the way he was with regard to his patients had a lot to do with his own trauma in the camps, of course. Um, so this connection was important, and it was important for Malibu as well because it brought together um, a disease which was considered to be um, the product of organic and organic problem with a conviction that it wasn't merely organic, that there was some other cause, and that this other cause uh, had to do with extreme existential circumstances. This connection was obviously important for Malabu because she mentions it. She mentions Bedelheim as an inspiration to her. I think she's trying to do the same when she discusses Alzheimer, and of course Alzheimer's, as you know, uh, probably, um, is important for her personally because she had this personal experience with her grandmother. In fact, uh, if I can be confessional, this is one of the reasons why I myself um, was hooked onto Malibu, because I too had, um, um, my mother had ex uh, Alzheimer's, so I, it was an attempt on my part to try and understand a number of things, and this was a kind of connection, but I happened to disagree with her reading, with her experience of her grandmother suffering with Alzheimer's. She's making it out to be as if an Alzheimer's patient is the same irrespective of context. Um, in fact, both my aunts and mother 
had Alzheimer's, had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and were very different, very different. They had very different reactions. So, you know, this was the starting point, as it were. But I, I wanted to try and see, try and understand why she's using Alzheimer's, which, let us face it, it cannot help you understand someone who has been raped. Okay, I mean, obviously you know that she has been taken to task by a number of people precisely for the kind of general theory that she is trying to put forward because she's talking about very different things. Okay, and she's doing it consciously. Which is why, as I said, I try, despite my resistance, I tried to understand where she's coming from and what she wants to do by putting forward a general theory of trauma. Okay, and why she's, she's using Alzheimer's as the kind of prototype, if you like. Okay, and she's using Alzheimer's, of course, for reasons we understand, because they become the epitome of the kind of paradigmatic survival that she wants to discuss. Okay, I don't know if I have yeah. responded. No, yeah, that helps, and yeah. especially given that in recent years we've rec started to recognize the inherited intergenerational nature of trauma. Um, this is very helpful. But on the other hand, uh, okay. Okay. I'm really sorry to do that, but we are running late and there are two more questions at least. Maybe you can capitulate. There's one question there and then one more here, and I think then we stop it, right? Hi, thank you for your talk. Wow, this is very loud. Um, I think I have a question that somewhere resides between uh, what do we, that I think I, I think I wonder what the exact definition and relation between trauma, materiality, and reality is. And I also wonder if for what you want to do, you actually need Malabu, or oh, whether yeah, there's sure. another potential theory of trauma that uh, might be better suited. And I want to motivate this really quick. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, um, you have to interject. The yeah. connection with materiality. Uh, Lies, I'm not finished yet. Sorry? I'm not finished yet. Oh, sorry, sorry. Apologies. Yes, right. please continue. Um, and I thought of that because I, I must say that I disagree with Malabu's reading of Freud. I don't mm -hmm. think that Freud actually says there's no, there's no point in like analyzing the corporeal wounds that like these soldiers have. I, like, I would think like what he's actually saying is my theory of libido um, my libidinal theory of desire doesn't explain um, whatever is outside of the corporeal damage and whatever I can explain with my libido theory, right? So I think mm -hmm. it feels a little bit unfair to Fry to read yeah. him yeah. in yeah. that way. And yeah. I think it's interesting that there are other people reading him differently, right? Like mm -hmm. Derrida and mm -hmm. Lacan, for example. Yeah, and Adrian it seems Johnston, to... of course, has right. responded okay, to Malibu precisely on, you know, on the level that you're talking about regarding he, her reading of Freud. Okay? This is not the direction I have taken, okay? because I mean, Adrian Johnston, I think, has given a very good response with regard to that. But now, uh, uh, Given um, your, your first question on the connection between trauma and materiality, I mean, obviously, uh, Malabu is talking about the lesional aspect of trauma. That is... Um, I don't think I'm finished yet. Oh, okay. All right. And I would think that the... Um, I would think that the, that the line... Interesting in that, that, which I saw you ending up with in the end, is that there is a much closer relation between what materiality actually is and what Lacan calls the real and this spot of trauma, which mm -hmm. I don't see so much in Malabu. Like, I feel like Malabu has a much more toned down um, understanding of materiality or corporea co corporeality here, which mm -hmm. doesn't, you know, like, which doesn't, um, which is not the same as the traumatic encounter with the real, which it is for Lacan, right? So like yes, in Lacan, yes. for example, you would say the real is the trauma, is the material basis of mm -hmm. the psyche. And Derrida, you would say that's even the material basis. I mean, he says that in like his later interviews, right? Like if he, if, if, if he was pressed to have any kind of understanding of materiality, it would be something like trauma, difference, something like that, right? So if you say in the end um, that... Um, I 
I think that's not my um, responsibility. That's uh, planning of the conference. I think I should be able to pose my question without being interrupted three times in a row. I only interrupted you because once. She interrupted me twice, you interrupted me once. You interrupted me twice now too, I've been interrupted four times. Um, so if you in the end like uh, show this scene of like of like this last character who becomes the new V to be like exposed to like a proper dosage of reality, right? Sorry, uh, can you repeat that? There's this, I don't find the quote. Um, you say in the end that this character who becomes the new V. Uh, Evie is, becomes is, the new V, Right, yes. is exposed to a proper dosage of reality or yes, something like that, right? Yes, this is a term uh, the Joker uses. Exactly, mm -hmm. that seems to be much closer to this other trajectory to me. Um, which trajectory? Well, that which I just have described, right? The Laconian, the Iridian yes. materiality, the real, and like this traumatic gap, whatever thing, somehow interfere much closer mm -hmm. um, than Malabu would have it. So, which is why I wondered, like, what, why use, like, the, why Malabu at this point, if that is like, I am trying to respond to the question raised by Malabu's insistence on the accident. I mean, this paper began as an inquiry into Malabu's understanding of the brute accident, which brings about the metamorphic event, that is, the material change, the lesional change on the brain. Hence, the connection with materiality, okay? My concern is that this understanding of the event does not help us understand the new wounded, the patient, okay? The new patient that Malibu is introducing and the political stakes that she is claiming for this new clinical category, which is why, on purpose, I am moving away from materiality, as Malabu understands it, towards Malab in, in Malabu, as I said, she's a new materialist, the emphasis falls on the lesion affected on the brain of the patient, either by a, a, an attack, okay, a fall, or by the actual effect of the shock, of the traumatic shock. She is emphasizing that the brain, the structure of the, of the brain changes. So it is the lesional effects, the material lesional effects that she is foregrounding in the new wounded. Okay, this is how she understands it. Can we have one more question? And I assume people who are still sitting here are interested. So this is the last question. It's not on? It's on now. Thank you very much for this um, rich talk. For me, it was uh, really um, uh, very productive. And I try to keep my question short. My question is addressing this differentiation between the new wounded and the old ones, mm -hmm. the neurotics. And as we all know, Freud invented a certain practice for the old neur neurotics, yeah. and it was talking, basically. Um, and I'm wondering if um, you could perhaps um, short, give us a short um, introduction into what um, Malabu perhaps is heading. Is it only the end of psychoanalytic fiction and perhaps also the end of the talking cure for yes. the new wounded? Or um, is she heading for some new kind of practice for the new wounded or how could I in a way see the future of um, this connection, uh, this new connection of um, uh, to fantasy which you promisingly um, said that an emptied fantasy may also be inhabited mm. Um, mm. by the new wounded, but how, through which practices and which kind of cure mm. um, is perhaps the psychoanalytic cure of the future? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, needless to say, um, Malabu is doubting the... Um, 
beneficial effects, the continuing beneficial effects of the uh, old talking cure, precisely because, as I have tried to show, she is um, emphasizing that the new wounded are people whose um, psyche and the narrative structure, the textual structure of their psyche, has been destroyed. Okay, so obviously the talking cure will not do. She is invoking the emergence of a, the necessity for the emergence of a neuropsychoanalysis, and this is what she wants to do. This is the project that she has in her hands. That is a psychoanalysis that will be informed by new developments in neurobiology. But when it comes to suggesting new cures, if you like, and that's your question, she has resisted. At least in the new wounded and uh, um, you know, works like in the ontology of, uh, of the accident, she has refused to talk about, I mean, she has also um, emphasized that we cannot talk about transfers. Transference will not work because these are people who you know, cannot feel empathy, cannot respond, cannot feel, blah, blah, blah. So obviously, all the old psychoanalytic cures have become bankrupt, okay? She has not suggested a way beyond. Uh, I think I'm trying to hold on to the old methods. Um, taking into consideration um, what she's saying, because I think it is important, and just struggling with it, really, because it's not easy, I think. Hmm? Thank you. Thanks again.